Happy Monday, everybody. Yeah. Hello, everybody. We are going to get started with the Weird Things podcast in just a minute. It's April 11th, 2022. Mm-hmm. And we are oh, we're doing fine. We're getting started exactly on time. <laughs> No issues. Yeah. Well, you know, you had to what you had to pull everything out, mm -hmm. right? You had to set it up, do the hokey pokey, turn it all around. Turn it all around. And uh uh sometimes there's some uh some kinks. Sometimes there's a little, little bit of kinks in the cable. Oh a little kink in the cable. <laughs> 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 thank you, old thank you. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cock really thank you, Cockney Steve. Cockney uh, the tech support. <laughs> oh me, uh, boy, I oh, and I'll sort you out. Oh, I just I you know, I'm getting a blue app. screen on my computer. Oh yeah, well, it seems it's all app apples and apples and bread knives. Bread knives. <laughs> it's just a uh, no round away Cockney phrase. Uh, well, I'm glad I learned something new here. Yeah, turn it off. Have you turned it off and <laughs> turned it back on? <laughs> Verging into Captain Morgan. <laughs> um, alrighty. Uh, da, 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 da. Hi, Andrew. Hello. Hello there. Hello. Um, I just realized I may not have responded to this. Oh, uh-oh. Okay. Res responded. Re resplendent. A resplendent respondent. I'm Steed. What was his name? Steed, Steed Bonnet. I'm Steed Bonnet, the resplendent responder. Resplendent responder. <laughs> Shit, what did we watch? Oh. Oh, you know what? Oh, man. I, I know, I know it. I know what my pick is. I've, I've got something that I think you would like, but I'm going to save it for my pick. Okay. And also, we've probably already talked about it to some degree. Probably. Um, probably. What's that wrestler's name? Uh, not. Uh, da Diamond Dallas. Page? Diamond Dallas Page. Yeah, it's there is something. there is a Diamond Dallas Page. It's got something to do with him. There is he's he's a interesting guy, interesting guy. Diamond Dallas Page. It seems seems like one. Mm -hmm. It seems like one. Um. Uh, but uh, I'll talk about that. Yeah. When I get to the show, and the end of it, the show. The end of. Allegedly, I mean, we we will we will allegedly get to. I mean, we will allegedly at some point start the show one day. We will, we will we'll end it there. theoretically. It's, you know, you get there. Um, but yeah, we had to. We we tore a bunch of stuff out to uh, to get ready for Founders Day. Thank you everybody who tuned in, who came by for Founders Day. I'm wearing my Founders Day crew shirt. Yep. Bum, 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 bum. Uh, those uh, those various uh, units of entertainment will make their way out in various ways mm -hmm. in in the coming weeks. Uh, yeah, the ICS episode's already out. That's right, it is. Including the second half recorded at my house. Yes, that's right. I should listen to that. Uh, it was pretty funny. That's good. Those guys are funny. It was a, yeah, there's a lot of me and Paul making jokes about Brian Adams. Oh. Uh, you ready to go, Maine? I'm ready. Cool, ready. ready. All Let's right. go. I'm going to count you in. In three, two... Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. <laughs> Gentlemen. Too much, yeah. too much fries. Br Brian might be coming in hot. He might, yeah, he might. We, we're not going to promise a Brian, but if a Brian shows up, just know that you were warned. Please no screaming when the Brian shows up. No screaming. You're ready for yeah. it. Please contain your enthusiasm. What do you think this is, Ellen? Come on. Exactly. I know, so, right? Uh, Gentlemen. Yep. I need two investigators. I need two whip smart, yep. intelligent, deductive reasoning capable people to help solve a mystery. Well, I don't know where we'll find two of them I at know. such short notice, but yeah. Uh I we'll mean just use you guys instead. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, my name is um Greg uh uh found it. I am a <laughs> uh -huh. I am I'm I am an outgrown child detective. So I was a very a very adorable child detective. Now I'm just kind just of a regular detective. A normal adult private investigator. Greg found it. Greg found it. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Encyclopedia I'm Encyclopedia Greg Khaki. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm Eric Seen It. I've, yeah. Uh, uh, seen his, his movie reviewer friend. <laughs> yeah, it's with a C. S C E E. Uh, and, uh, uh, I've seen, I've, I've seen things 
I'm Eric. Yeah, every it. episode of uh, Mrs. Columbo. I've seen it. VHS exactly. That I've he watches. And that's my very confused by. That's my catchphrase. Very confused by. He was very confused by Voyager. <laughs> what, is, what is Mrs. Columbo doing? Ah, I've, I've, I've seen it, but I don't know what's going on. Yeah. yeah. All right, so you Gentlemen, got... I'm going to take you to the scene of a death. <gasps> oh, my God. You hate it when this one happens, huh, partner? I would love to not have this happen every single time. Yeah, it's yet... a real uh, humdinger, you know, cir- circle of life and all. We're I've... only born to die. Yeah, I would maybe keep the modeling stuff a little quiet. This is an active crime scene. Yeah, well, I'm not. It's not modeling. Right. I'm just commenting on the fact that there's a death here. We all need to process it better. I think as a society. Yeah, but I think we need to clean the blood up first before we really start processing. I mean, who am I offending? The police? So, I, don't, I guess I don't. Is good the, news. The let me good open my news, eyes. This happened. This happened millions of years ago. So we're good. Oh, Uh-oh. don't you have egg on your face? I seen it. <laughs> I've got brontosaurus yeah, we're egg on my at... face. Exactly. You got prehistoric egg on your face, you Ugh. dork. <laughs> Wait for me when you're done. I'm done. <laughs> I'm sorry. You brought in two <laughs> investigators. You wanted investigators. We're investigating. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, I'm going to start striking other stories from here because <laughs> we're never going to get through this one. Uh we're we're in North Dakota. Okay. Okay. And it's a great we're at Dakota. a site and, and we're in looking at a Thesclosaurus leg. A th- and, uh there's okay. actually there's also the skin of a triceratops, you know. Mm. We're, we're looking at some looking at some body parts here. All okay. Right? The skin? Like uh are we talking well, about fossilized skin? Like fossilized skin, rice. Like, yeah, yeah, it's not like like snake skin or something like that. No, but uh, I mean, is, are we talking like a like uh fl- are we talking flakes of skin or stretches? It's like petrified skin, I don't know, man. Bryce, piece yeah. of skin. Like <laughs> like I I'm, hold everybody, pause the podcast. <laughs> yeah. I'm hopping onto a plane. I'm going to North Dakota because yeah. I got questions. I thought that's what you were doing on the podcast. Does it matter if it's if it's if it's a a, 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 a fleck or enough to make a jacket? Just, like are are yeah, you trying? Bryce, how does that enter into your calculation? Is there a spreadsheet here exactly. you're gonna pull up and enter? How does this oh, load? Sorry, guys. Did you say 9.3 millimeters or 9.4? Because that makes a world of difference. I'm just asking, are we measuring in millimeters or are we measuring in me- in meters? I need enough for a loom. <laughs> a Found loom it. I, I, of triceratops skin, please. <laughs> now, I expect this from the narrator, but found it. You're my partner. No, I know, <laughs> seen it. That's you. That's my version of you at, at Joanne's. <laughs> Oh, my, asking like, for asking for this. This is my skin. special. Joanne's is my special place. Please. I mean, imagine like a thigh-sized piece of skin. Okay, a yeah, thigh-sized. I mean, okay, that's that's actually helpful very much. Okay, thigh-sized oh, in God. seven oh, years ago. Shut up. <laughs> 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 <Don't learn. laughs> okay, so there was a murder here millions of years ago. We're in North Dakota. There's some skin. deaths. We don't know what you, you're jumping ahead here. All we oh. know is we've got the body, we've got the leg. Of a uh, Thesclosaurus, we got some skin from a Triceratops, and we're trying to figure out what happened here. I think we can rule out natural causes. <laughs> Pro- probably, probably likely. I don't think the dinosaurs, despite all of their myriad amazements, die by having their limbs fall off and their skin be extricated from their bodies. Yeah, I feel like if there was a dinosaur plague, a bubonic dinosaur plague, yeah. we would have heard about it. We would have found vos- fossilized bubonic plague. Also, cells. even the bubonic plague didn't have skin fall off and legs fall off. That's right, yeah. It, it, it just killed them. It, it would just, just be regular. So I think I was thinking of leprosy. I think this is... Some kind of foul play. I think that this these dinosaurs were murdered by another dinosaur. Oh. Now who would have so the I'm means gonna and motives? <laughs> I'm going to add some more to it. I'm going to add some complications, okay? Right. Okay. Uh, one of the, I think the person working the site, his name is Robert De Palma, relative of Brian De Palma. Really? And he named the site Tannis, the resting place of the Ark of the Covenant in Legends of the Lost Ark. Oh. Oh, that's okay. a fun fact. Wait a minute. Yeah. 
Oh, uh, say, I'm yeah. starting to have a what little you, uh, uh, secondary thoughts here about the veracity of our evidence. Uh, uh, this guy seems like a real look at me, Louie. You think we don't have a real dinosaur leg and uh, skin? Can I? Uh, uh, how 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 peer reviewed is this narrator? <laughs> There's some, uh, let's say some people in the community are like, hey, we're not so sure. We agree with the findings here and some of the circumstances in which these things are published. But let's just go with the theory. Let's just sort of explore the theory of what happened here. Well, I mean, if, if we if we are to believe the evidence and let's put a pin in whether or not we do. Okay. Uh, I would say that the most likely thing that that happened is that there would be some kind of super predator that would have ripped these uh, other animals apart. Uh, uh, these, the, you know, a super dinosaur that w just uh, went on a, a rampage, ripping off limbs and skin as if it were, you know, just something to do. A, me a mega dinosaur, a, a next level up on an the, apex. On the apex, yeah. An apex you know, dinosaur predator. Something out of Jurassic. World Dominion, you know, the, the something like that. Yeah, right? whatever. They always uh, got to keep doing a new. It's like, oh, that's, they, they, that's it, a great feature, a great theory. That is absolutely you guys. No, because there's oh. no bite marks or claw marks, guys. Oh, what? maybe it just ripped it apart. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, sure. Just yeah, it's all hands. Yeah, they're pretty the, big. The Mangosaurus. <laughs> Yeah, the the opposable thumb, yeah. thumb rack. Pull apart a Saurus. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they just love pulling things apart, like uh, like like uh, uh, Christmas crackers that the British Quick, have. Throw a stretch Armstrong in his path, and it will run away. <laughs> it's like <laughs> he can't do it. He's just so pissed. <laughs> So they invented pull, ah, stretch pull, pull. Us, you know, we got you this time. <laughs> so no scratch marks, no bite marks. Are huh? there are there any indications of sawing or um, tools having been used? <laughs> it's the Domersaurus. <laughs> yeah, wait, hold on. Was uh, no. this the dinosaur mafia where they were trying to dispose of the evidence? <laughs> were there four cement shoes located nearby? Yeah. Uh, no evidence of sawing. <laughs> okay. Mm. <laughs> Head Ganosaurus. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, uh, I'm 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 unpinning my pin that I put in the fact that I think that this is this is fraudulent. I believe this well, is we'll fraudulent. Let's just assume that's let's assume that's legit. Let's assume it's legit. Okay, so okay. no, we, we want to move forward here. Okay, no. the skin and a detached leg from from the dinosaur times. All right. And I like when we say dinosaur times, which last com way, way longer than our times. Um, Absolutely. So I'll throw in some other little findings there. You ready? Oh, mm -hmm. please. Okay, I'm going to complicate it. I'm seeing, I'm seeing the scene of the crime. This is too simple. We should probably complicate it so it makes it more interesting. They found a fish, a turtle, the embryo of a flying petrosaur encased in an egg, and glass-like particles of molten rock lodged in the gills of fish fossils. Gas? Glass-like particles? What the hell is going on here? <gasps> Andrew, did a dinosaur get blown up by a thunderbolt? No. Ah! No. That would have been very cool. Because in my head, like, oh, you know, when, when thunder strikes uh, beaches, it makes, like, glass uh, pieces. Yeah. Fulgurites, yeah. So, uh, but I want you to follow that. Because remember, we, we, I just said... Found fish there too with glass particles in their gills. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would assume that there was probably a different lay of the land back then. So maybe there are lakes in places that there are not lakes today. How do you get gl how do you get glass that is not man-made? Maybe the water, the water boiled. Boiled water. Oh, it boiled. Oh, did it? it did it zap like a? Not did it, is that was like, it, the was it like a spring? Like the, do you want, the do you tide? Want it, do you want a volcano? It, Underwater you... volcano? No, no, no. Hmm. You want to hear the time, the estimated time when yes. this happened? Yes. Yes. 66 Last million. Week. 66 million years ago. Hmm. Narrowing it down. I'm trying to remember where I was 66 million years ago. I know. Okay. How young we were. Uh, glass. So far, uh, could it? Oh, could it be? Uh, um. Meteor? 
Dun, dun, dun! The claim is this was the evidence of the strike that took out the dinosaurs. What? This is all the way up in North Dakota, but they show a map of where there's hit that stuffed debris went flying. Remember, there's something the size of a mountain. Hit in the middle like the Yucatan, which is what, you know, we say that led to the climactic collapse that killed the dinosaurs in like a very short period of time killed the, the excuse me, the non-avian dinosaurs. And so they say this is evidence of the violence of the impact and that like the fish and stuff were thrown, that these were these dinosaurs, the shock waves ripped them apart. What? Oh my gosh. What so that's the claim. The claim that this is the the the, the receipts. Of of the yep. the the final moments of 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 the dinosaurs, but uh, uh, let let's can we get now into the the uh, pushback here that that some folks are not uh not 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 in love with so this reporting. The the, the the part the challenge with it is that uh that it's pointed out, and again, I don't we don't we don't know anything here. So if we if we improperly impugn the reputation of anybody here, uh. I want to just apologize ahead of time. Yeah. So yeah. Um, this is for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> this is not legal advice. This is not legal advice. Not medical advice. It's this uh, astrological advice. Uh, this is from Science Alert. While paleontologists usually cede their rights in curation of fossils to institutions, De Palma, who had collected a few academic laurels until the who had collected few academic laurels until the discovery of the site, insists on contractual clauses that give them oversight over the specimens. He has controlled how the fossils are presented. In response to the article, Kate Wong, scientific, science editor of Scientific Erica, said in a 2019 tweet, the findings on the site have met with a good deal of skepticism from the paleontology community. Uh, a few peer-reviewed papers have since been published, and the BBC said that a dig team promised more. So they're doing a whole documentary about this. So uh, this is like... And other people seem to think that this has evidence of it. So it's not It's not like... This so this isn't is like not... Fringe this Gotcha. Yeah, it's not like someone French paleontology. Yeah, yeah. This isn't a situation where we're, we're going to see pictures and it's it it's obviously like PVC pipe or something like that. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't <laughs> think so. That'd be hilarious. Uh, it's a pivosaur. Oh my, yeah. No, I think it it might be paleontology. There's whole Dino Wars entire book written about this. That is a very, very you, you mix you mix like the the history of like frontier cattle barons with scientific exploration and the you know the drama of that and you get the hunt for dinosaurs so. i was gonna say yeah i don't think either of those archetypes particularly breed a magnanimous attitude of of, of cooperation there there's there's a lot of you know kind of a, a a gold rush instinct in in both of those fields of, of finding the thing and proving the thing yeah uh so cool i i look wow. for like you know we we can't you know people who are you know outliers you can't just dismiss whatever they're saying and yeah a lot of really crazy sort of things that we now accept is well that's the truth started on the fringe of like we have evidence like that can you really like hey we, we heard the sound in this this radio telescope and we think it's the big bang like what and yeah then, yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess that makes sense. It is the big bang. I guess my my so, only my only thought on this is that I had never really thought of the idea that we were lacking in evidence of this. I I, I thought that that was. Remember, this is like the day that it happened. Yeah. So think about this. Literally, the day that it happened would be when this would have happened. So that's the hard part, is because is dating you might have that. Yeah, because remember that yeah. the the this took uh, it took years and years and years for the dinosaurs to go extinct and. The idea that you're seeing physical trauma or things like that that were like that's really kind of amazing and like if you look at the 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 zone in which they look through so you might find a dinosaur that may have died on the day but all the way around the other side of the world because it was just you know uh, carbon monoxide poisoning or something or mm, yeah. you know but literally it was literally it was more like they would have starved out or died a while later because of uh, the basically shutting down a big part of the uh, plant life on our planet uh, well, here's something that's less than shut down. What is? In fact, it's functioning optimally. Oh. And that is the Patreon for this very podcast. Uh, where could I get that? Patreon.com slash weird things, Bryce. Thank you. It's stupid you didn't know that, but, <laughs> but I'm glad that we were able to say the name because it's an audio podcast and people need to hear it. Right. Patreon.com slash weird things is where you can support this show. Kick us a little bread. You're going to get early access to the After Things podcast, which is all about how to live and work as a creative professional by folks who live and work as creative professionals. 
Head on over oh, right us. now. Oh, that's us. us. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's oh. us. You know, uh, come on. Uh, dust off the <laughs> resume. Give some, give some advice. Patreon.com slash weird things. So I want to do just a little, little plug here for some work at an organization that I work for, which is called OpenAI. Oh, this is and good stuff. Yeah, so we released last week uh, Dolly 2. Dolly, which you, some of you may remember, was an image generation system. Dolly 2 is a really new, improved system for basically taking any text input and turning it into an image. And it is a very exciting hot field. Let me clear. There are other people, researchers, who've been doing some amazing things uh, in, in text to image generation. And, uh, you know, I personally feel like this is a really big leap forward because the way it works and how it does. And if you look at the quality of images that it's been generating, people have been going nuts. And yeah. So. Uh, uh, some of the reaction to this has been uh uh very very interesting and i would love i would love to have a larger conversation about it but for folks who are not seeing the images right now dolly 2 is the latest version of this ai model where you in plain english can just type things like uh, a koala dunking a basketball and it will show a, you a koala dunking a basketball more than that you can say in the style of whatever whatever style you can think of and it will give you that image that you just that you just said. Uh, it and, is, and you can take an image and say, "Hey, change the image in this way," uh, and it will. So you can take a picture of a dog and say, "Make it a cat," and it will replace the dog with a cat. And you can give it like a classic painting or illustration of something, and it will create variations of it that look incredibly the same style, but looking different directions, different ways of, you know, it's, it gets the, you know, it, the, there, we have a paper linked to it online, which if you're interested in the technical details, but the idea is that it tries to deconstruct what is the, the gestalt of an image, you know, what, what, what makes the thing, why is this photo of a dog interesting from the, or the painting from the style, whatever, and it says, okay, well, I could have the dog face the other direction, or maybe I can make the dog sit on a blue chair instead of a red chair, or do all these things. So it's completely generating these images. And I have people who go, like, is it is this like Google search? It's like, no, like no. these images don't exist. And it's exciting. The styles, if you go there, we have an interactive tool so you can play around and see the different ways in which these images are created. And you know, you can say, I want teddy bears in the style of this or doing that. Uh it's been Playing with this for over the last several months has been insane to see this, and uh, you know it's it's a as a creative tool. And to think about this is that you still need a person telling it what you want to do. You still need a person selecting for this. And we look at these tools to amplify creativity. They're not a replacement for it; they're an amplifier for it. And you, as an existing artist, you could take this tool and you could use it to create variations and do different things. And it, it really is not like the goal is not to say therefore art is solved. Well, no, it's like here's. It's here. therefore here's another tool. Uh, the reaction has been fascinating. Uh, 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 obviously, this is a very, very interesting application of AI. I have long thought that uh, the the gulf between where AI is and where it will eventually be are regular people understanding exactly what the power here is and not just sort of making it into a metaphor for magic. Uh, at the same time, though, when you see the power of this, you see some of the reactions, which I think one of them uh, <laughs> asked how demonic this tool was, uh, 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 considering that it might be an affront to art. But I, I think your your take is, is correct, at least from my perspective, Andrew which is uh, this only gives more tools to artists and, and uh, uh, does not, I think, take away anything from it, at least it, my perspective. Yeah, I mean, the camera, when it came out, was revolutionary and was frightening. And you had some people who thought, well, there goes you know, the, art, the whole art of making silhouettes or whatever. And it, it just became now people learning how to use camera. You still had to figure out where to aim it, what to do. And then it just, it gave us so much more capability to sort of capture the world around us. And this is a tool for kind of capturing what you're thinking about. And when you start thinking about really cool kind of imagery, like I, my editor, I wanted to thank my editor. So I looked, looked on his Twitter timeline and I saw that he had a couple photos of squirrels and he liked Magic the Gathering. So I made a magical squirrel, you know, casting spells over books. And, and it was just a neat just, way to see. Boom, wow. it's done. Yeah. You write that thing and you have... 
a version of that. And uh, I, I will say that compared to Dolly One, the images here are stunning. Like, like they yeah. are, they are uh, 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 at times photorealistic, at times in incredibly artistically rich. Uh, uh, the, 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 the breadth of styles are, you know, almost night and day from some of the images that would come out mm -hmm. of Dolly One. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. I did one that went viral, which uh, Bryce just showed, which was my space raccoon. I did a uh, uh, a raccoon astronaut with a cosmos reflecting on the glass of his helmet, dreaming of the stars, and you get this. It's now it's a, a wistful raccoon <laughs> looking into space. It's perfect. It's at three thousand six hundred ninety four likes and five hundred retweets because, and a lot of people who were like skeptical about AI were like, "This really sold it to me." Now I, I look at this and I go. Cool. Uh, to me, like that part of the thing that people respond to is, you know, how much the AI has learned about puppy dog eyes and how to make things look wistful and sad. But there really is like this image here, which was I did a raccoon wearing a hoodie working on his laptop. And a lot of people are impressed by the light because you see yeah. it's at night and the lights coming from laptop. You see the fingers and it's light transmission. It, it understands that it learned that from these images and to, things like that are really interesting to me, like. How much does it understand? And it breaks apart too. Let me be clear. Like go go to openai.com, go take a look at there, and you'll see fail scenarios. And I I want to make it very clear, like this is an evolving technology. This is not solved by any by any means. There's more complex ways to to create images that humans can do that this cannot do. Yeah. Uh, you know, we don't we haven't, you know, built this thing yet to do text. It'll sort of do text, and it's funny because it'll misspell stuff. Um, you know. There's a lot of limitations from a technical point of view of what it can't do. And and there may be some wall out there that we don't know about. It's possible that there could be something like, oh, there's an ultimate limit to what you can do. But man, like we you'll see some teddy bear examples. And that came from when, when I was playing with it. I was trying to think of like, what are cool real world objects that you could use? And so I started doing teddy bears. And the first thing I did was a teddy bear and a hall of mirrors. Uh -huh. And watching it create a, reflections of the teddy bear in the hall of mirrors was really cool. Wow. Bryce, you have a look at your face. I, that's oh, okay. No, that's a great idea. No, Bri Bryce, cool. is, Bryce is scrolling yeah. through all of these examples yeah. here. Uh, uh, and, you know, some of them are just remarkable. Like, it, it I, I can understand why, on first blush, if you made your living doing art, that you would say, what, you would look at these images and think, how long would this take me to, to do? And, mm -hmm. and, and have maybe a little bit of a John Henry and Inky Poo kind of, kind of moment. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, I think in the hands of artists, we're going to see some exceptional stuff as we, this continues to we've go. We've seen, we the internally, like first the, our team that worked on Dolly, they play around with it and they're super clever guys. And they're very, very conscientious too about thinking about the impact of how they look at this as an ability to give people who don't have artistic abilities a way to express themselves, to give other people this like kind of a, a way to increase, you know, everybody's potential to express themselves that. And we talk about like, there's when internally working with them and the stuff that they came up with and, you know, the stuff like I, my dumb ideas. And then broadly within the organization, when more people try it, but we're always like, we can't wait to see what other people will do with it because there are people are going to think of things we never thought of. And we've been seeing that where we have a tool, the edit tool, where you can go take over part of the image and say, like, change this and do that or the variations. And we're watching people make animations now and watching wow. things growing, like doing like ground and seeds growing out of the ground wow. and doing all kinds of like, you know, we, I didn't think of that. You know, I don't remember anybody talking about, hey, you could do this. Maybe some of those people on that team did that, but people just independently really creating cool stuff and taking an existing art. They could take a piece they did and now go in there and edit and do changes like that. And that, that's what's exciting is that is that when you see artists and people who are creative embrace this tool and then surprise the creators with something that, you know, they didn't think about doing. So right now this is in beta. How, how yeah, can people play can, around with this? Go sign up. If you want to sign up, we have a wait list. And we at OpenAI, that we do things in stages. And part of it is, is that our goal is to develop beneficial AI. And that is AI that's going to benefit humanity, which means that we don't take everything we can do and rush out to you know commercialize it uh, because we're doing really advanced stuff. And we want to take the time to evaluate how it's being used. And you have an image generation system. And people are worried about deep fakes. And that's that's yeah. a thing that we we have... Not to sound arrogant, but every every 
hot take, every what if, every disaster, scary scenario that you probably hear externally, we've debated this internal. It's not like we're all, we all agree and go, let's just do it this way. We're like, what about this? What about this? So there's a really healthy debate internally about how do you, how do you implement this stuff? And one of the things that we do is we do things in stages and we start with a small group, let people experiment, try it. You know, going back to GPT-2, the first text generator, because like GPT-2, like, when that first came out, like open eyes, like this may be too dangerous to release. We don't know. And other yeah. people are like, what do you mean? How could that be dangerous? And it's like, well, there are different points of view on that. And, you know, so we're going to do this in stages. So we're going to be basically rolling out access as we understand the capabilities more. Um, goal, you know, like it would be wonderful to just make this as widely available as possible. Um, but, you know, we, we, the more feedback we get, the better we can do that. And you think about, um, uh, I don't know, it, like it, it, in terms of like, I don't know, the idea of there being backlash against this. Um, I mean, I'm sure there are typewriter companies who did not like the idea of word processors or computers. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, at the end of the day, you know, it is a tool, right? You're, you're giving a tool for people who may not be able to make, create, photograph, scan, render, what have you. Um, you're creating a way for them to approach general technology uh, and say, hey, if I could come up with an idea in my head, how do I get it visible? How do I get it viewable mm -hmm. to other people? And sometimes that means you make a teddy bear and you take photographs and you find 1990s computer parts and you figure all that stuff out. Or maybe one day you can just say to the computer, hey, show me some give teddy me, bears. Give me this image. Yeah. And yeah. That's 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 really remarkable because it 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 almost sounds outlandish, but with how much technology has evolved over the past de decade, it is uh, incredibly it sounds incredibly plausible and very very close. I yeah I think that the things are always going to be disruptive. You can't have a technology that ha improves something with an order of magnitude and efficiency or whatever without it disrupting something else. And, you know, Justin and I went through this when we had a magic publishing business. And then as the cost of doing video or distributing video freely online plummeted, we watched our video sales decline because basically piracy became a big rampant thing. And, and, and piracy destroyed a big part of like the magic video sales industry for me. And, and I could have said, ah, oh, this sucks, but I'm going to, I'm going to stand out there and tell everybody this is wrong and we shouldn't do this. But I'm like that innovation of video online created things like YouTube and stuff. And I think it yeah. increased the availability of human knowledge. And personally, I was affected. I was impacted by it, by it, but then I moved into a new space and embraced this to figure out a way to do it. And that's not an easy thing to say to people. You're like, ah, just suck it up and then do the new thing. I think if you're really skilled and you have a really, really capable artist, you're, you're, there's going to be a way in which your skills are going to be magnified, not not minimized by this, because, yeah. you know, the word processor, people worry that the word processor, you talk about that was going to affect everybody who's going to become a writer. Well, here we have a tool and I can tell you that I can tell the difference between somebody who knows what they're doing and somebody who doesn't when they want to create an image. And when they're trying to sometimes you happenstance, you happen upon a really lucky image. Other times, you know, there's that. And so. And um, I don't know. Imagine this paradigm of you know, art creation, right? Um, or or a, in terms of using this as a tool or as something for accessibility, you could use this, uh, you, you could find a way to, to, to write the story of this, of someone who has difficulty w w with, with, with visual thinking or, uh, or has um, a, a fantasia or so is, is unable to, to really mentally process or uh, store, create, synthesize images. But if they have an idea for something, you could take someone who has who has difficulty with creating visual images, plug it into this device, and then paint over it. Use that as inspiration. Use that as a starting block, and you could put you could open up the visual art world to people who are not vis who are visually um, impaired. And mm -hmm. like that's what that's, uh, yeah, that's stunning. Yeah, it's one of the areas we're looking into now is that, you know, assistive using as assistive technology for people that, that, you know, maybe physically or some other lim way are limited to do that. I, I see the end, end, end goal, end game for something like this is that we, we use as the amount of information we are presented with has increased. 
we've looked for, we, we use compression in ways we don't think about it, but we use things like an emoji. You know, if somebody does something you like or whatever, and you want to show appreciation, Slack is like a, an emoji delivery mechanism, as far as I'm concerned, because it's like yeah. most of the communication, if you look at the actual number of things said in like my company Slack versus the thing said through emoji, emoji, far more emoji communication than this. Somebody says a thing, then, okay, I recognize, I acknowledge this. Uh, memes, memes, GIFs, and memes are really effective ways to communicate stuff. The The challenge with emojis and memes, like any other sort of predetermined uh alphabet or you know library inventory of things to communicate is they're not yours and now with the technology like this i would love for this to be built into things like your keyboard where you know you could say hey communicate a thing or what you want or describe things to a friends or share a moment and just effortlessly just communicate back and forth through these things i think that would be wonderful uh i, I also think really the the next level promise for stuff like this and i've i've long thought that people training their own ais and 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 taking this technology to a a level where you are are using it kind of on a more personal level is just fascinating to me like like an artist mm -hmm. that is able to visualize certain things that either so they can retouch them and make them exactly how they want or uh, uh, to just take their own work and be able to iterate on it within this framework is a game changer in in a way that I think was was not previously thought possible. Uh, we we did have a question in in the um, chat that I, that I am curious about. Uh, are there copyright restrictions? So if somebody has has access to this, or or, or do you own the things that you make through Dolly too? So right now, the way we're doing it, because it's just we're literally literally an exploratory phase, and it's used through our labs. Uh, front end is it's we're like not it's not for commercial right now you know yeah. so we we have we encourage people and they create stuff to share it with attribution whatever to circulate share their friends we're not not allowing right now like nft creation or anything else like that and not that we're against any of that and not a matter of being against any of that at all it's just at this stage is you know we're trying to look at the impact we're trying to figure out the utility and whatnot and so it's sort of step by step yeah trying to work things through so that is the way i'd say things like this is not a Oh, we're against this. No, we're not. Like we're, we are, our DNA is we're a research org. And yeah. so we have to start from a research point of view and then figure out, okay, if we do this, then what are the implications there? Then if we do this, what do we do there? We, we, we want to get this, you know, most of us want to get this in the hands of as many people as possible as we can yeah. and let this be part of what people do. But, and, it, and it makes sense why you would be cautious about that because uh, I could imagine uh, not, not knowing anything about how any of this works, uh, that it's kind of a Pandora's box situation a little bit of, hey, once we once someone starts training one of these models on copyrighted material, screen captures, GIFs, things, you know, things where it's not just synthesizing things based on public domain or open openly available yeah. imagery, uh, it's going to be very weird. It's going to be is someone... A company is going to have to explain why uh, different angles of Chris Rock being slapped by Will Smith is being generated by their by their yeah. machine, and someone's going to have questions about what that means. Also, Andrew, yeah. could you generate Pandora's box in the style of Norman Rockwell and just send it to Bryce? <laughs> uh, maybe I could. Um, <laughs> so the uh, yeah, it, it's there's there's the expression was I don't know was it. Um, William Gibson, who said the future is already here, but it's unevenly distributed. And part of what that is, is there's, you know, there's this awareness of like deep fakes and stuff, but other people don't know. Other people don't know how far ahead this is. And I've seen this where there was a thing that came out of, you know, the worry of, you know, the, the war in Ukraine about like deep fakes affecting things. And I've had some people like, ah, oh, look at this, get, go look at this deep fake video of, you know, Zelensky, you know, saying that he surrenders. And I'm like, yeah, and I will show you that same tool used two years ago to to replace Putin's face with Novani, his his uh, his would be rival for the head of mm -hmm. Russia, who has been currently put in jail by Putin. Um, you and, know, and that's mm -hmm. it. And like a two year old, and that was white propaganda, so to speak. And so that's all. That's to me. I look at that like, oh, that that those horses left the barn and they involved into Pegasus and they flew away. Yeah, th th that's to, but to other people that they're not there and other people, you know, people like right. maybe see this and think that it's real. And everybody, everybody I know is skeptical and guzzles. And like we know that people can watch a video and not believe that it's true. It's just reinforces what you already think and how you use it. And I'd say that 
I, I'm kind of like, maybe we just need to kind of just OD on fake images. So then we get to the point where we're like, oh, yeah, everything could probably BS. So I'll just move right along. I mean, a lot of the misinformation that was happening around or is happening around Ukraine is like people taking footage from other wars or from video games. Oh, yeah. Like we don't even need deep fakes to be spreading. And, yeah. And, and, and by the way, uh, not new. No. In the history of war and the startings wow. of war, uh, uh, the worst place for any kind of information to come out of is war reporting. Like it is, it is fame and has been famously, famously uh, uh, un un unreliable. So the fact that there are new tools to make it more unreliable is only exacerbating an issue that's been there forever. Let's see if I can Here we go. Thing. Come on. Uh, 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 I'll tell you what. <laughs> I I love 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 this this tool and I, i've found the conversation around it so 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 interesting uh uh the 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 visceral reaction that i saw from it both in terms of people being very excited uh and, and not in a way that's like uh uh you know uh, uh, like oh this is a cool proof of concept like this was a an ai uh, uh application that I think really, really, really spoke to people on a level that uh, uh, has has not before, and that's what I love about OpenAI is is you guys are really, really, really dedicated to finding that that gulf, like like finding out where people can uh, kind of understand it. Because once you do this, that's that's the soup to nuts experience. Like like the only thing that is that is left to explore is. How did this get here? Oh, okay. Now that I understand both what my input was and what this output was, it gives people a framework to understand what the training is, the framework to understand how and why this works and not just AI being, you know, how or, or you know, some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of thing. Yeah. Did and we get it? I just got an email from one Andrew Main, uh, and I believe these are 10 images of Pandora's box in the style of Norman Rockwell. Oh, my God. This wow. is amazing, and they are all. They look like uh, uh, a loopy you know, Disney one here, but yeah, a, wow! And it's like Pandora's box is like a cultural idea. It's got a bunch of different visions of what that looks like, what that, not just what that object is, but what that event and story it's describing. And there's, you know, there's, but some, it's all consequential. That's the thing is that each and every one of them has a sense. Of drama uh, uh, or or suspense to it, which is uh, which is just amazing. Like, look at this one at the bottom left. Like this, if you told me this was like a classic painting, like an impressionist painting or something, I would, I I would have believed you. Ah, wow, wow, that's incredible. But I can run that again, and it'll generate ten more images that are going to be equally as impressive and equally Gosh. impressive. And and the exciting thing is that like, you know. We at OpenAI, like, we know we're like this cool. We also know where, and you read the paper, you can see, like, here are some limitations, but understanding that we'll probably know how to solve for those and be able to improve upon it. And it's, it's a, I, when GPT 2 came out, GPT 2, I talked about that years ago. I was, and I'm going to make my plea, by the way, here to everybody who's thinking about or interested in the AI. GPT 2 came out years ago. I I think I just started programming. I think I just started to learn Ruby. And I was so fascinated by the idea of, a, and I'd played with simpler systems that generated text and they just weren't that good because they're just trying to predict the next character or whatever, maybe the next word. And the idea behind transformers, which is the same thing that's used here, is it tries to sort of look further ahead to sort of see if this thing makes the best sense instead of just going one by one. Because you might say, oh, this next stroke doesn't really as a low probability, but if you put this other stroke way further out, then it increases the likelihood of it. So I remember going through GPT-2, OpenAI had published all of, they published a bunch of text that it had generated. And we read them here about the unicorns and the, yeah. the, the unicorns, the Andes. I went to GitHub where they had hundreds of examples and I read through every single example, trying to wrap my head around the way this thing worked. And I started to get a sense of like, oh, okay, I think I know better when I read the paper when they talk about this now because I can see this thing. I have an idea of what this effect was. So when they came out with GPT-3 and I got asked to be one of the people to, to, to 
beta test that. I was excited because I came to it with having been obsessed about GPT-2 and what it could do. And that's when, you know, my, you know, my working relationship with OpenAI started because I was able to say, hey, I coming in from a writing point of view and somebody who's obsessive about this, you know, I think I think I may have some different insight onto this. It might be helpful here to sort of think about capabilities and stuff, whatever. And ergo today, I'm the science communicator for OpenAI. Um, GPT-3, GPT-2, that spoke to me. That spoke to me because I understood, I could see it trying to infer logic and do stuff like that. Then we came out with Codex, which was only not that many months ago. And I think for a lot of people who were in tech, but who really didn't know a lot about machine learning or AI or were skeptical of the potential, all of a sudden you had this tool that now is built into, you can add as a plug into VS Code that's contributing, you know, last reported account was like 30% of all new code in the major languages was generated with the assistance of this AI we created. Wow. And that spoke to a lot of people. Now this image generation has spoken to another group of people who all of a sudden look at this and go, oh, this is what AI can do. Yeah. And that's the thing is I think that we're, we're slowly but surely showing people this is the potential for this. This uh, is the potential for this. And, and let, let me let me just say one more thing about Dolly too. If you have seen AI generated imagery, one of the things that I think has become sort of synonymous with it are a lot of kind of like half faded, blurry, like almost like kind of things where it's not even like impressionistic in the way that you would think of a painting, but but kind of things that are sort of put together in a weird way. What makes Dolly 2 stand out is that these are strong lines. Like these yeah. are very strong, striking images in in a way that I, I've never seen AI generate and certainly not in the kind of fidelity that that it that it does so kind of effortlessly. Yeah. I you, you can see a little more of that when it like tries to recreate like painting and illustrations where that type of variant is more natural but yeah in, especially in the real photo realistic sort of generation like it looks very clean there's a lot uh there's there's a good amount of detail and sharpness that looks outside of that dithering effect yeah and we're past the way back when we were working on dolly and before an early version of that and i was looking at the outputs and I asked the head of the team because it still had that sort of weird sort of wispy sort of like thing from AI, which is very common with people who suffer from certain kinds of like, uh, you know, brain disorders and stuff, which is weird because it feels like certain neurons were, you know, firing or whatever in a different pattern. And I asked, like, is this going to go away? And he was like, it should in the next training session. And it went away. Wow. And that wow. was that was the moment where I felt like we kind of were starting to reach takeoff because the, the models got past that, so were able to able to do higher resolution and really like if, if some people say, ah, there's a limitation here, or whatever, like, yeah, there is. Like probably already know how to solve for that. It's a big basically how we train for that and do whatever. Assuming. Could be, you know, maybe yeah. not. And some some things you might go, ah, oh, it didn't do this as well. That might be by design. Mm -mm -mm. You know, for certain reasons. But anyhow. Uh, wow. It's been exciting. I've been so lucky to have a front row seat to watch uh, these incredible people work on this. And so my, my plea to everybody else out there is if you're inclined, you think AI or machine learning is interesting, study, learn more about it. It's going to need people from wider fields. You know, you might say, well, I've been working, you know, I'm a police officer. What could I do? Well, we're going to need people who understand policing and understand law enforcement, understand that, you know, maybe you're an attorney and you understand the rights of individuals and stuff where you're using these tools for a lot of places. You need people who have expertise about this to provide guidance and to help shape it. I mean, it's it's just it's just a thing that the AI is going to affect everybody, and it shouldn't be limited to just people with extensive machine learning backgrounds. Be only ones to decide how it's going to impact society. Other people coming in and offering points of view and understanding how to test it or figure out its value is critical. Absolutely critical. Yeah. So. Amazing. Gentlemen, do you want to do picks? Yeah. yeah. I got a pick. Um, Go ahead. Uh, I uh, finished finished watching this last week or maybe the week before, and I uh, I was I was pretty regularly taken aback by it because uh, it uh, it kept surprise. It, it, so my my pick is <laughs> is the Adi Shankar uh, show, The Guardians of Justice on Netflix. Um, it is a uh, it is a mini series, so it's like one season, and they kind of have it set where 
they probably won't do another. Um, but it's 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 um, okay. So Adi Shankar has made like a bunch of online videos where like oh it's the Punisher, but it's like realistic looking action and yeah, uh, you know a lot of visual effects stuff. He did. He did, he does movie level short films that that oftentimes, especially in the world of comic books, like he did a Punisher short where they had Tom Jane who played Punisher in the movies, but now he was doing kind of something that was a little bit more uh, certainly fan service in terms of what you would want from from a Punisher movie compared to the ones that he was starting. Yeah. And so what you have here in the Guardians of Justice is clearly like a Justice League knockoff ensemble of superheroes. Um, and uh, it is a mixed media mystery um, show. So it is like part live action, but part animated, part uh, cartoon, illustrated, claymation, miniatures. Um, it all really kind of flows in and out of these different aesthetics pretty, pretty, pretty smoothly or effortlessly, it feels mm -hmm. like. Um, and it tells a, a an interesting kind of gory uh uh, mystery uh, story basically the idea is that hey what if uh in a world of superheroes uh superman was the first superhero and he was an alien and he showed up during world war three and he stopped mecha hitler uh, okay and then and then what happens the next 60 years as we move into the modern day um and then what happens when that superman goes away um and why um uh, it's interesting it is uh uh starring uh in the main role as nighthawk uh, one uh, Diamond Dallas Page <laughs> as a grizzled, uh, too old for this S word, uh, Batman style character called Nighthawk, and that's uh, amazing. Uh, he he's exactly right for the role of a grizzled. It, he's good. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Uh, and it's and the whole show is very wrestling. It's a lot of like flash and very quick. Uh, quick, you know, quick edits, quick changes, um, and I, I don't know, I, I kind of dug it as just a dumb sort of visual effects and a superhero idea. I don't know. I, I, I think you would like it specifically, just. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm fascinated. Uh, uh, as a wrestling fan, I'm well, well, well aware of DDP. I, I never considered him, uh, a. Uh, you know, much of much of an acting range kind of guy, uh, yeah. but but I'm I'm fascinated to see it. Yeah, and it's it's not a lot of range. Is is a, a pretty specific character. Sure, but, yeah, yeah, but, but yeah. I mean, more than playing DDP, who is by and large, yeah, especially these days, uh, a bit of a sunny uh, a sunny figure. Uh, uh, but yeah, um, fascinating. But yeah, it's it's cool. It's very bombastic. All of the music is that kind of like synth wave <laughs> yeah um and so it's it's neat it's neat uh a lot of uh andy milanakis andy milanakis plays like the jimmy fallon the new age jimmy fallon of twitch on in this world and so he pops up a lot too anyway that's great guardians of justice is how long is it it's a seven half hour episode oh so it's a quick so it's pretty quick you can, you can rip through it yeah and i would recommend that you do it's not don't subtle. stay there. Don't, Don't stay. Just <laughs> run because it's, it's worthwhile, but buzz right through but town. Really get in and out of it. Yeah. Because the novelty of all the mixed media stuff is very cool. It's very interesting. You can tell that they are really able to elevate it beyond what you would get if you were just doing live action or just doing animated. Um, and I think if you compare it to something like The Boys or like Invincible, which are both mature superhero shows, yeah. Um, this is both in between the middle of them and then also very different because of it. So. Yeah. This seems, uh, uh, pretty BSI. B BSI. B big, bat, big stuff. Bat, incorporated. Bat boop insane. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Hey, uh, speaking of things that are pretty wacky, uh, I'm uh, making my way through raised by wolves. Ooh, uh, what, what, where, how far in are you? I believe we have like three or four episodes to go. Of season two? Of season two. Ah. And I will say, and I mean this as both a compliment and 
a uh, a soft criticism because I'm not at the end, so I don't know how everything ends, right? But it reminds me a little bit of Lost, and I and by and large, it is the positive elements where every five steps, boy, do we see something that is fascinating about this place that we don't know a lot about, and uh, uh, at times a little frustrating in that. Characters that could tell other characters about these fascinating things don't immediately tell the other characters. But then again, nobody asks. I'm I'm on. And nobody asks even. I'm 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 not to the end. So uh, I will I will see how it goes. But by and large, I've really loved it. I really really loved really? it. Oh, in, cool. in that in that it's always ahead of the audience. It, it it's one of those things where just when you kind of think, oh, okay, well this is the conflict of this season. This is the thing that that uh, everything's going to wrap around. It kind of moves on. It resolves, and now we have another thing. And so the thing that I thought was a tentpole for it is now gone. And mm-hmm. and so I I like that. And that is very unlost. Like in that when 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 Lost showed you a a, a glowing uh, a thing, you were like, okay, well then I guess we'll find out the answer to that in fifty episodes. <laughs> I, I yeah, you know like. We we had a lot of criticisms of Raised by Wolves. In fact, I think we ended it. We ended covering it on Spoiler in Time, saying that we probably wouldn't pick it up for season three. Uh, but a lot of stuff happens. I, uh, you know, I mean, it's I, not like nothing happens. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I I I like to the Lost point. It would imagine if everything on Lost had a to- coherent, cohesive reason. And not let's just put a thing in there so you tune in next week and then we hope you forget about it because we don't really know where it goes. There is clearly to me a narrative in Raised by Wolves. There's a story of what happened in the aftermath of this, which they're moving towards. So I enjoyed that. Like I enjoyed the fact that like I go like, oh, because like I had my theories in the first season and they've been confirmed in the second season about this. But it's not for everybody. You know, other people tune out, but like I feel like I'm surprised that you guys, Bryce, because you guys have patience for stuff that I go, I can't even see how you could see your way through it. Where this, like, I'm like, I'm like, cool. I'm in uh, yeah. to it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm digging it. I'm digging it. <laughs> yeah. And and I, th- I do I, think that that yeah. the the themes here are far more coherent. I mean, I still don't know exactly what Vost was ultimately about, except for a writer's room that clearly had daddy issues. Uh, uh, other than uh, other than that, the big picture issues. I don't think we're ever really fully fleshed out where it's like here it is at times, you know, almost flashing too brightly. The idea of, you know, what is God? What is man? What is belief? What is, you know, uh, uh, these are explored in very interesting ways that involve flying snakes and and uh, uh, AIs. <laughs> and like with yeah. Lost, it was like, oh, there's a four-toed statue. What's that? Like, don't worry about that. No, that's the most interesting thing that's happened this entire season. Yeah. And you, you oh, go another dad, you know, like Jack didn't really resolve his issues with his father. And we're I'm like, really? Yeah. Like that's, that's where you want to go instead of giving us some deep narrative that can exist through time and like, Imagine there's a box, and I get you anything you want out of this box. Okay, well, that was just a metaphor, guys. Yeah. Why mm. are you so obsessed with it? Like, because that was more interesting. We're here, I'm like, this to me, like, uh, yeah. but. Yeah, I mean, like, there are not, if if you wanted to do a Lost-style show, like Raised by Wolf Season 1, uh, it would be hard to imagine doing Season 2 um, immediately after it. Like, you, you to change so much, uh, I, I actually feel season two is far more lost like to me than than season one was. Oh, season yeah. season one, I think, was a little bit more of a spare meditation. Uh where this it's like every episode there is new like yeah, uh, you know, the, the first one was exploring, I think, who was on the planet, and this is exploring the planet in a way that, you know, uh, certainly the end of season one certainly hinted at. And this one, I don't know. Mm. I, I like everything that's happening, I really, really like. I'm 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 I am only expressing the lost thing in that there were are a few moments where something crazy happens and then the characters will talk to each other and it won't be like the craziest <laughs> stuff in the world literally <laughs> just happened to me. But then again, you're also mixing in AI and, and robots and everything. So there is a little bit more of a, a thing other than lost. So there we go. Raised by Wolf season two. I like it so far. I'm going to do two picks because uh, I feel entitled. 
Uh, first is I watched the season finale of Severance. Ooh, what you And like? one of my top, top five best shows of the year so far. Um, you know, Peacemaker's probably my favorite show this year. Severance, I love, I love, I got, I stopped reading science fiction because science fiction got to be very derivative and there wasn't a lot of fresh ideas in science fiction, was my opinion. It wasn't like this period of like the 50s and 60s and stuff where you could just pick up a new paperback or new, there, well, I couldn't pick up a new paperback then, but I have old paperbacks from then and be like, oh, cool, space elevators. Oh, cool, a ring world. Oh, cool, this. And science fiction of late just is like so. There aren't any new ideas to me. Like I just, I haven't. People, oh, you should check out this. Like, oh, that's cool. And there's a rare, but there's there are occasionally, but just not the pace. Severance took a concept which has been in science fiction. You know, the idea. And there's a lot of science fiction stories about, you know, what if you create an AI version of your consciousness and it's trapped inside of a different environment? Like that's probably like half of all Black Mirror episodes. But here they did it in a very different way. They did Severance does it in this different way where the idea of you put a chip in your head and then you go to work and you don't know, you have no concept of what's at work and that person has its own life at work, which is fascinating. And you look at the how that world is built for those people around there because everything they know is basically inside their office from their religions to all the stuff. And that's a fascinating ground to explore. It really is. And I think the characters are great and you know, I had kind of predictions about like how I thought where this was going to land and I was going to be perfectly happy if it landed there and it landed where I thought it was going to be. Um, have you guys been watching it? Uh, I have not yet, but, but I will, I will, uh, it has just been a particularly busy couple of weeks. Yeah. I will, oh. I, there is, there is a, I've watched two people like, oh, severance explained thing that have completely missed on a very, very important detail, a very, very huge detail, which uh, I, it, it mm. I want to say it. You Can I? Uh, I mean, now you'd be spoiling it. No. <laughs> well, it, it, it's I, not a, not revealed. It's not revealed in the, the season finale. It's just a little point that I want to make. Uh, I hear? I've seen the show, so I, I, I don't care. I, All right. Um, so, you know, these people, they go into the severed state, they go in there and then they go back into the normal world. Mm -hmm. We have no idea where this place is. They live in a city named Kier. They live in a city named Kier. The maps say Kier. And if you look, anytime there's an address, like the last time we saw an address, the state was PE. What state is PE? Uh, yeah, the license plates, be... the license plates don't match any state license plate. They got the same image of Kier on the license plate. Well, and they... You know, they mention in the first episode and not really much more afterwards that, like, Mark uh, lives in corporate housing. So how does that work if you're supposed to stay, if you're supposed to not know who you work with? Anyway, this is well, now, yeah, this but is, they, now they, we're they, just they, having a very... But, but a point, my point is, like, that's a my minor, but, like, like literally, like, they, they mentioned, like, in the episode, they mentioned, somebody mentions New York, but literally the world they're in, the normal, the, quote, normal world... Mm. Like I have again, I've been watching these. Ah, oh, we're gonna explain. It's like cool. Will anybody explaining by the fact that the license plate don't belong to any state, and when we do see an address, it's not a real state. I'm like, this is like, I think there's more going on here than anybody's acknowledging. <laughs> so, oh sure, it's yeah. subtle. It's subtle, and it could just it could just be BS, just filler for later on. But I feel like a very Truman Show kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, what was your other pick? So. My other pick is the book. I just finished this. I really enjoyed it. And it is Moonwalking with Einstein. And this is a book about memory. And it's been consistently a bestseller by Josh Four. He, I mentioned this before, he was writing an article for, I think it was Slate or Salon years ago, where he went to the U.S. Memory Championship and expected to meet a bunch of savants and people who are just so different and whatnot. And they're all normal people. They're like, no, I'm just a normal dude with a bad memory who decided to learn memory tricks, and now I'm at the U.S. Memory Championship. And then he talked to he talked to like people from like the international ones, and like, yeah, the you know, and he talked to some people who did the international memory championships, and they're like, yeah, you know, Josh, you could win a U.S. one. It's not that competitive. And he's like, ha ha ha, that'd be funny. And then he's like, well, that'd be kind of a neat story if I train for it. So Josh Four decided to train for the U.S. Memory Championship. Starts one year before. And then he trains over this period, and all along the way, he studies memory. He talks to people who've lost their memory. He meets Kim Peek, the basis for Rain Man. 
Uh, he meets another personality who I won't name, who is another who's been presented as a savant who was born this way. And Josh does a very good job of saying, I think this guy is just another memory expert, but running a scam. Wow. And points this out when you read it. It's like, you're like, holy cow, like, I believe you're right. Because he's like, I told this person, like, they said they, were, they had a seizure and they had these, th these powers and they tell people this. Yet here, this person in 2001, whatever, was selling a memory course, yet claims they never do these methods. And uh... then, you know, they're on the memory board. So, uh, that was, and I'm reading this, I'm like, and this person has been tested by top memory experts. And I'm mm. like, having worked for James Randi and mm -hmm. seeing what happens when people don't realize they're in the presence of somebody cheating them, I'm like, and, and like, then I, there's a, like, you read the Wikipedia and they're like, oh, this person says, oh, like, he should have focused on this or whatever. I'm like, I think there's something here. I, I you know, and, and Josh, I think, was extremely compassionate to this person and was hesitant to put them in there. But just this, this person would say that, like, oh, I see color, I see number, the number 922 is this, 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 and Josh would meet with him again. Like, how do you describe 922? And he'd say this, and it was a different time. Every time he had a different explanation for it. And Josh was like, and he showed memory athletes just like, oh yeah, he's, this is, this is a memory athlete. Like watch him doing this lightning calculation and they see him moving his ring across the table. Like, yeah, that's how you keep your count. This person may be a natural savant, but the book does a pretty good yeah. job of saying, and in Josh's point, like, which is more remarkable, that this guy was born by some weird fate, you know, has a brain or had some accident that's a fate that, that, that acquired these abilities, or that anybody, that he's proof that anybody can do this. You know, he did it for a documentary. He went to another country and learned a very difficult to learn language in like two weeks. And to me, the much more interesting story would be the fact that this guy just has trained himself so well to do this. But it was, anyhow, uh, and it's not like, it's not like psychic stuff where they can't do it. Like, you can do it, but right. so can other people. So I love that part of it. The end of the book, Joshua goes to the American, the United States Memory Championship, and he wins. Damn. And he sets the record. And then he goes to Europe, and he, he places much lower, respectable, but doesn't realize, like, the European level of champion. But he's like, because the European was like, you could train, you could do well here. He's like, I'm good. I'm good. You yeah. know, I'm good for this. So it's it goes in... What's it, that? It, is it more of a biography, or do, would people reading this expect to learn techniques? You would learn. Of, you of... would learn the techniques. You would expl you would understand the techniques. It's a great entry point to these techniques. It's things like master system, person, action, object, memory palaces. These things are all explained in there. So it's a very good introduction to the topic of memory. So uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I was skeptical going into it because it had one of those sort of silly, you know, a head, uh, you know, title, a title meant for the, you know, some editor at some publishing house to get excited about but then i read it and he's a really good writer and he's done a number of talks about it and i think he's very pragmatic about it and i think very very fair to his subjects so uh and again the fact that the story is and then hey then he wins the championship is just mm, neat. great ending so, that's great yeah. yeah what a what a way to do it so really good participatory journalism so uh and it's funny because he shows up there at the memory championships and somebody's like oh it's like uh you know, imagine being a guy who, like a sportscaster, somebody like this, that all of a sudden decides you're going to have to play against LeBron James. Like he's yeah. hearing these people like criticize him, and then, and then he goes through and he ranks, and then he sits down to sets like the U.S. record for memorizing a deck of cards and stuff, and then they're like, they're like shutting up. So, oh. um, moonwalking so really with Einstein, very cool. And uh, you do learn, like, yeah, these these, you know, I think I mentioned a while back, like started reading some other stuff on this, and then like now, like I can't get. I have all I like the top fifty most populous countries stuck in my head. Can't get it out. They can just <laughs> they built that IHOP mental palace. It's firm. It's firm. Like I don't even bother testing myself now. Like a week will go by and I'll be like, well, do I? I'm like, yeah, they're there. So and these I, things are interesting. International house never falls. <laughs> Gentlemen. Yep. It's been weird. Alrighty. Good show. Uh, alrighty. We'll. Uh, take a second here and get ready for after things. Do you have a have a meeting you got to get to, Andrew? I got to bail at eleven thirty. In twenty five minutes. Yeah, twenty three. Twenty three minutes. Okay. Uh, all right. Anybody, Andrew? Do you have a bathroom break? Does somebody need one? Yeah, I'll use one. Okay. So I can roll yeah, if you go, okay. then I'll stay, and then I'll go, and you'll stay, and then Bryce will stay the entire time. Why don't, why don't you just go now, Justin? You just want to do it? Yeah, you just go. Do it. Just do it. Do it. 
Hello, everybody. We'll, we'll get started with after things here in just a moment. Thank you for joining us here. Uh, uh, thank you again, everybody who to, who joined us for Founders Day over the weekend. And uh, if you didn't get a chance to see it, don't worry. Uh, we recorded it, and a lot of it will be on the feed. So the Great Night episode that we recorded will come out in probably a couple of weeks, not this week. Um, the Ice Cream Social that they did has already come out, uh, I believe. Um, we, we recorded their bucket show. Um, I don't know how much of that that they put that they put anywhere. Oh, here we, here we, go. we do have video for that, too. And then uh, uh, we're going to talk to Allie and Mike and the Possum Posse. The Possum Posse, Possum Posse were great. They, they, they had, they, they, they like had like, like perfect time slot. Like they, they were kind of our headliner more or less. And uh, they, they started, I want to say about 10 or 15 minutes before sunset. And the area that, that we were, we were filming at is like, it's got this big overlook. And it was just, it, it just ended up being, uh, ended up being, being very cool, a very cool uh, uh, location compared to some of our other live events. So uh, those will, those will come out. Um, uh, anyway, the, it looked very cool, but then we were, we were kind of uh, we were rushing to kind of get everything done and we were focused on getting the live show done. And I wish, I, I wish I had taken an extra minute and put up, a, throwing up a few more microphones for the possum posses uh, set. Um, I do, I do wonder if uh, uh, how it's I don't I don't know that it sounds as good as it did live with when you have a big when you have a full drum kit and full and electric guitar amp. Um, well, we'll see what we do with that. Um, but but um, Mike and and Ali's sets uh, also came out great. All sorts of good stuff. So, uh, I don't know if you heard the news, but my little book, Sea Storm, made the Wall Street Journal bestseller list last week. Oh, indeed. I've heard. Uh, that's Now it's at 1,800 reviews. Ooh. Well, that's great, man. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, dude. Just what, a, what an awesome achievement. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Would you like to do some after things? Yes. Okay. Then I'll count you in for after things in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, little, little shameless self plug here. Although mm -hmm. I don't really. Yeah, it is shameless because I don't feel any shame don't. at all. Yeah, you shouldn't. This is a celebratory right. self plug. This is a celebration. Woo! Celebrate your plug. Come on. <laughs> so my new my new book, Sea Storm, which is the third book in my Sloan McPherson series, the Underwater Investigative Investigation Unit, um, uh, just hit uh, Wall Street Journal bestseller list last week. Boom! It already. Yeah, the sequel before it had already hit that list was already like as funny as talking to the editor uh, publisher. And, I'm like, uh, hey, did it make the list? She's like, it already the, the series already made the list. It says this, you know, on the page. I'm like, I know, but did this book make the list? Because, <laughs> yeah, you know, it it matters. I otherwise I'm gonna have to hate myself. I wouldn't really hate myself. I don't really care. But uh, so that's exciting and it's really cool. It's already at 1,800 reviews. Uh, uh, I will tell you, I can't. I won't get into numbers just yet. But we're talking a lot of copies of this book out there. Ooh. So that's exciting. moving units. Moving units. And I wanna I wanna tell the story of why I did this series, if I may. Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'd love to hear it. So I did back in the day when I decided that I wanted to get into thriller mystery. I liked science fiction. Science fiction I loved. I love science fiction. In our last episode, I kind of ranted that I didn't feel like there were a lot of new ideas in science fiction. There are some, but not at the rate at which they happened before. And I thought, well, thriller mystery is cool because thriller mystery has a much wider audience. And those people really like an author and keep buying books. So part of it was a commercial decision. I'll be honest with it was the idea that if I want to make a career as an author, I should probably write books for people who like to for read people and buy who, books. Yeah, who who buy and read a lot of books. And this yeah. this audience shreds. Like there is not a pace at which you can write that will sate the 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 thriller yeah. mystery reader. 
So I, I did the Jessica Blackwood series, and that was because I didn't write a female character because I was trying to exploit any sort of market sort of thing. I just I knew I wanted to write kind of a magic detective character, and there were already a lot of male magic detective characters. And I thought that writing that character as a woman would be more interesting because dealing with as as a is a dude who doesn't really understand what it's like to have to deal with, you know, paternalistic structures, misogyny, and all this sort of stuff. I, I'm never going to be able to do that experience justice, but I still wanted to write a story where somebody had to deal with a different set of problems than I had to deal with. And so that was, cause I thought that would make it interesting because a magic detective is sort of an overpowered kind of person. Yeah. And so well, I, I, what I, if what? Yeah. And, and I do think for you with, with, with Jessica Blackwood, you did understand the experiences of women inside the magic community. And, and you wonder like, I, like to, to put that context, like into, into a larger oh, thing. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah I, if, I, if it's narrowed yeah. and it's niched, at least there's, there's an element that, yeah, that I mean, you can I, see. I, oh, yeah. Only as far as it, it's pointed out to me, I, I want to be, cause I want to be super cautious here. Cause like, I, sure. I don't know. I don't know. And I, I just got to say, I don't know what the experiences, I don't know the lived experiences of other people. And so I, 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 I never, ever, ever, ever want anybody listening to me or whatever thinking that I'm like, well, I know what it's, I do not. And yeah. so, you know, and, but, but as I, as a storyteller say, Hey, you know, it would be neat to acknowledge, to acknowledge those experiences, to acknowledge what people have told me, whatever. And to try to say, Hey, you know, this, this is probably more challenging than what I dealt with way more you know, difficult. So that was one reason I wanted to write like the Jessica Blackwood character, um, just to sort of say, hey, what if this, and I want to be able to write people and different people, but I never want anybody to think that I'm, you know, trying to tell, oh, let me tell you how you feel, people. <laughs> That's never, and that would, I would give up writing if that was ever my attitude. So I did that, and Jessica Blackwood was very successful. But then I wanted to try to write, you know, uh, long story short, I talked to a publisher and like, we'd like you to write like a male, would you want to, would you want to try doing kind of a male character? I'm like, yeah, I'd like to do a male character. And the, the, the the TLDR of that was I created my Theo Cray character and I wrote The Naturalist and the publisher's like, nah, not really into it. We don't think it's a really good fit. <laughs> and then and I'm like, all right, cool. And then my agent, uh, uh, Erica Silverman, who is amazing, amazing. Erica has stood by me for years. Erica believed in that book and believed in me. And then she took it and she found a home with Amazon Publishing. And that has been a wonderful fit for me because... Uh, I knew there was going to be the choice. The trade-off for me was going to be, I was not going to see my books in bookstores. I wasn't going to see them on the shelves of bookstores after that period. When I went from a traditional publisher to Amazon publishing, which focuses more on eBooks, they do do print and they can be found in some bookstores. But I knew for me primarily it was going to be digital. That was for other authors. Like that wasn't the leap they wanted. I would, for me, I'm like, I started in digital. I started yeah. with eBooks mm -hmm. and I was fine with that because I thought that it would be a medium that would, it would environment that worked well for me. And so that was the first launch was with Amazon Publishing, was with The Naturalist, which, you know, the book that was by people I really liked before at the other publishing house, and they had very good reasons, I'm sure. But watching that book spend seven weeks as the number one book on all of Amazon, outselling Harry Potter and everything else, felt really good. Yeah. It felt really yeah, good. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. yeah. So that, but that's, and nobody know. And I, I didn't believe in that book at that point because of what I went through, but my agent did. She believed in it. She championed it. She did that. And sometimes like I go through this with my wife all the time where like I go, she finishes the script. How do you feel? Goes, I feel numb. I'm like, yeah, that's the feeling. You feel numb. You don't know. You've, you've gone over it so many times. I had to build a checklist. I had to build a checklist to say, did I accomplish the things I wanted to do? Because that's my only guide that I did what I needed to do. Because you get so done with the story and you're so over it at that point. You're like, ah, okay, how do I feel? I feel like, you know, the end of a big hockey game where everybody just is in the locker room. Like, you know, the, the expression is they left it all on the ice. Yeah. You know, and like that's the end of a book. You feel like that way. So The Naturalist was a really big success. And then I started doing books. And I and I told, told my publisher, like, I would like to be able to write multiple books per year. I'd like to be able to do that. And... Their publishers are hesitant towards doing that because getting an author to deliver a book on time is hard. And, <laughs> and, and, and authors are sometimes way, not just weeks, but months and sometimes years overdue on books. So there was a hesitancy there, but they saw that I just, I delivered reliably and the books were selling like crazy and they were getting great reviews. You know, under them, I've had like an Edgar Award finalist, a Thriller Award finalist. So critically, they were there. 
granted i could be a much better writer and i feel that i'm i'm i don't i think i'm a good writer i don't think i'm a great writer i think i'm a good writer stop um yeah no, we're no, celebrating I, I, what's wrong with we're you? celebrating no but I, i'm not i'm not like uh bad. Yeah, no, I'm like, but we I don't think... we don't need to i mean it's <laughs> fine you're you're, you're a great I, writer I, no, I think I'm good. I yeah. think that I can, I think I'm consistently good, and I think that there there maybe if I worked at my craft, I could maybe do some things that were great. And I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to be like false humble or whatever. I I I, I spend two weeks writing a book, guys. So I, I, like, well, like, I mean, I know, <laughs> I know, okay. I know. But also, so, I do think that there are there are things for which you are very very talented at. Yeah, that you have optimized. And so, yeah, yes, like, like, uh, could you spend more time with it? Would there be a a a, a material difference? Probably. Uh, but we just talked about like output speed is important to you. Yeah, well, it's funny. I, I'll move past that part. Okay. But uh, 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 <laughs> I am aware of like, oh, if I think I, I should, if I I should spend more time in this space, in this space, there would be an improvement there. But I'm lazy and whatever. But anyhow, point is. Uh, those books did really well. Those books have done extremely well, sold ten, you know, a lot of copies. And then I pitched them. I said, "Could I do another series with you?" And they're like, "Okay." And so I pitched. I said, "Okay, I want to." Said, "You know, like I, I got to bring Jessica Blackwood into the Theo Cray universe, which I like. I love that we've got uh, Mastermind has her in it, and then we got a new book coming out later this year, Final Equinox, which is going to be very interesting because it is kind of my most sci-fi sort of premise of a book." premise for a book but then with this i i i was thinking about who's an interesting character and i thought like like police divers are fascinating because they go down to their crime scenes and the things they look at are underwater you know they're different environments and it's entirely different challenges in florida you have to deal with things trying to eat you and and i thought okay what do i want to do here and i'm like you know i i know a couple florida women we talk about florida man florida woman is its own sort of breed of headstrong outdoorsy very athletic good sense of humor sort of there's a personality and i think justin you yep. you you recognize that know that and yep. i said man i want to write i write like there is i want to write a character like that i want to write a character that's that's you know it's comfortable you know going to you know a, a nice restaurant on las olas and then next day going into a hopping into a canal or going diving and whatever and having a knife strapped to her waist and whatever i mean that that kind of those those characters are fascinating to me so i wanted to write a character like that so i thought like i'll do a story about a woman who's a police diver but who's really more of a diver who then has to become a detective so that that is it and also was based on what i know like i grew up in south florida but i took so much of it for granted i took the fact of i knew all these places and stuff i knew diving you know having done being di a diver when I was young, then going through everything I did through the Discovery Channel special, whatever. So it seemed like a great fit. So that's when I came up with the Sloan McPherson character. And I made that choice because it was just like this to me, like it's it's not the most out there. I went from magician from family, you know, what caught from family and magicians and, you know, the world like Theo Cray, like. The secret about Theo Cray is like, I think he's probably one of the smartest people in the world when I write that book. Like, I think he is probably the most, he is like a Richard Feynman, one of the most analytical thinkers there is, thrown in a completely different environment. Yeah. And that's sort of the secret to when I write him, is I try to think about like, yeah, Theo could probably figure out anything with the evidence or the details, but he's got to work with people. And that's the challenge. And he gets better at it and he's less, you know, there. But anyhow, with Sloan, I'm like, I'm going to make her normal. She's above average, she's slightly smarter than most people, but she's not a super genius like Theo. She's not this exceptional magician like like Sloan. Mm -hmm. She comes from a crazy family. She's got a sense of humor about her, but she is very hands-on. She's not going to sit there and like build a mental palace and solve a crime. She's going to be like, I'm going to go dive in that pond, and I'm going to stick my hands into the muck until I find something. And it yeah. may take me two days to do it, but when I do it, I'm going to have that thing and I'm going to know what to go do next. And so she's determined and whatever. So that was, it was an interesting choice for me is to make somebody who had a very interesting job that people understood and who was a very normal person. Mm -hmm. And that book became my bestseller. Like, like overall that series has done phenomenal. Naturalist did crazy, but this, this just exceeded that. And that was like, Amazon was thrilled because that first book girl we need to see, you look at that, it's over 16,000 reviews now. Damn. Um, Incredible. And it's been amazing, amazing, you know, to sort of watch these things, see where they go. So, 
I made these choices all along because I wanted to write this and I understood who my audience is. I'd say that's the sort of the, the, the takeaway the TLDR is you have to figure out, like I could, you know, I work with people who are in tech and who are entrepreneurs and we talk all the time like, oh, this would be a good business for you. This would be a good business for you. But the advice I give to them is pick the one that you're going to wake up and want to do two years from now. Yeah. Not the get rich, not the fast thing, because you, you read a headline for somebody sold something similar to something you know, and that's in anything. Pick pick the thing that you're going to want to do. And these characters are kind of like this. Like, I have to weigh up to one. I have to want to write Sloan for the next book and the next book and the next book. I've got a new series that's going to launch. And I'm still working out the details of that character because I've got to make somebody I'm going to write for four or five books. Yeah. Um, well, and now you know what that experience is and you know when, you know, uh, uh, challenges you've had a, a few books in and, and reasons why you've uh, found that characters have life, you know, a uh, uh, past, mm -hmm. you know, a few, a few adventures. Uh, I think the, the biggest things from my perspective in watching your career from the very beginning writing wise is number one, you have a great sense for conflict. You have a great sense for uh, what, enriches i think a reader's uh, the, the 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 story that a reader goes on in their mind of uh, uh understanding what things are versus uh uh the the resolution there and also from a business perspective the fact that you uh, uh have always gone toward the consumer perspective of just making this stuff uh, uh, available and working with people that i think care about that the most and uh uh, uh you know, your, your relationship with Amazon, I think has been hugely beneficial for everybody and, and has exposed your writing to so many, so many people. So it is, it is, uh, uh just, just been, uh, amazing to see you find a partner in this that cares in the way that I think a distribution partner should, which in the world of publishing, Boy, is that <laughs> Not a easy. rare, a rare thing to find. And I, and I will say there is none of this. There is no writing career. There's no success. There's none of this without you, Justin. That is, that is your, the, the right point you materialized and were instrumental towards this. I, I was, without, yeah, I, I was, I was, I was, I was, what? I was, just, I was, I was there. I was oh, there. Stop. I was there. With, I was you, there. You, it was, and to this day, when I talk to other people who are getting input or feedback, I always use you as an example. I'm saying the great thing about the way you would give feedback was you never tried to put you into your feedback. You took each thing and you recognized what I was trying to do. Yeah. And you talked about the story, the story, the story. You were never like, well, you should do this or you should do that because you knew I'm the one writing the story. And you yeah. were the person, but you were, hey, I'm the audience. And I'm going to tell you as an audience what worked or what doesn't work. So you understood that like what I needed was, let me just slide this under the manuscript, under the door, and then you're going to slide it back and say, question mark, question mark, question mark, exclamation point. And that's. I think, yeah, there, there's to, to me, uh, and I know, I know, Andrew, you got to, you got to bail soon, but um, the, the biggest thing that I would say, and when you said it at the end of a script or the end of a book, you feel like you are uh, uh, spent. The, the biggest thing is, did you, I think with the way you put it, uh, did the things I want to get done, get done. And so my feedback early on, uh, and this has stuck with me throughout all the you know, even production on like Dog and Pony Show and stuff like that is just, is it clear? Is, you know, so the, the biggest notes that I had for your, for your early stuff was always uh, uh, just like, oh, I, I don't, I didn't get this. Or like, can you explain this a little bit more? Just because I know where you're going mm -hmm. by the end of it, but it's like, can this be clearer? Can this be uh, 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 something that is, that is filled out more? Just give me an example of, of something that, that fills it out because now we know where you're going. And I do think that that's something where, boy, it is, it is so helpful when, you are trying to figure something out and you're, and you're polishing as opposed to trying to restructure. And I think that that's often yeah. the thing that people fear about feedback is that you're going to hand them a picture of a zebra and they're going to say, it'd be better if this was war and peace. And you're like, I, well, that's not what I was trying to do. Yeah. And I, I'll go into this another time and maybe in a, a video was like, I, I pay a lot of attention to structure because if you get your structure right, 
it's so much easier to edit. If you don't get your structure yeah. right, it's painful because then you're told you've got to throw everything away versus change this room here, change this room here, and you're fine. I did go through a book once where I had an editor I'd never worked with who didn't like the structure. And I'm thinking, they thought it was my first book. They thought they didn't think I'd ever written before, which is sort of funny. <laughs> and they're like, I don't think this works, doesn't work this, and I'd already been a thriller finalist. And not to say, therefore, I know, I don't, I don't. But I was, I was confident enough to know when they said that, I'm like, you know what? I'm sticking to the structure. I'm going to stick to this because I think I think this is outside of your expectation. You're trying to make it like a conventional thing you're dealing with, but I think it holds people's interest throughout whatever. And that book was a finalist for an award and was a sold a gazillion copies. And it was like, but I I had to get to, had I been a younger writer, I may have been, oh, I don't know, maybe they're right, whatever. Yeah. And not to say, like, I have uh, Ed Stackler, by the way, he's the editor that's worked on uh, almost all of my books in the last several years. Uh, Ed's fantastic. Ed's great at like, I don't get it. I don't think this works. Explain this more or whatever. He he never tries to write. He'll rewrite. He might, he'll, he'll change like the sentence if I have something phrased awkwardly, which is highly likely, but he's been great. It's been a dream to work with Ed and, and you find that, you know, I'm in a great position team wise where I have an, a wonderful agent. I have a wonderful publisher. I have a wonderful editor that I work with and, um, May everybody be lucky enough to find a team like that. And then, you know, at OpenAI, work with a great team there. And that's been watching, like, our launch for Dolly and mm -hmm. the publicity and everything. Like, open and, up and your Google podcast and, and podcast. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. yeah your uh, podcast. You have a great team. You know, it's another, another thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah sure. Up. Hey, I got to go. Uh, it was okay. great. Yeah. Um, listen, yeah. I got to go do okay. a thing. Okay. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Mann. Andrew Mann. <laughs> Wall Street <laughs> Journal bestseller. That's right. Andrew Maine. Um, but you know, I, that is, that is a good point uh, that kind of came out at the end there is um, giving good feedback, giving good notes. Um, I, I, uh, I'll share this. I've, I read on Twitter um, uh, someone who works in, uh, I'm, I'm going to get some of the details wrong, but uh, someone who I believe worked quality assurance for Bungie, the, uh, yep. the video game company. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they talked about that the the system that they use to give feedback for the games, right? Because when they build, when they make a build of a game, it's a long, involved process. It takes a long time to test, you know, these many, many hour long games. Yeah. And so that they they would have uh, a tiered system of feedback. Basically, um, here is a thought that I have. You have no obligation to do anything with this. Yeah. Um, here is an outcome that I would like to be different with the thing that I'm looking at. Yeah. So make the sword more powerful, make the character run faster. Um, or the third one was, here's what I would like to... Uh, uh, basically, the, the second one is directing you to do a specific action, and the third is saying, this is a problem, find a way to solve it. And I'm giving you the latitude to figure out how to get from A to B. Yeah. Um, and uh, that is that is a very rigid system, partly because quality assurance on video games is so big and so structural. Yeah. Um, but you can take a lot of those ideas away when you're giving feedback um, as managing or supervising anything of either I'm telling you something that you have no obligation to do absolutely anything with and it will never be brought up again if we don't do this. Uh, or I want you to specifically do this thing or I need this specific solution regardless of how you get there. And it's kind of helpful to remember that these are... There are three poles of the of the way you can say something, but they're all very helpful um, yeah. to know and delineate from ahead of time. You know, I do feel like stuff like that does require a base level knowledge of the subject for which you are cri offering critiques sure. on. Uh, like, for example, if you sent me a new album, if you made an album... I don't know enough about music theory to tell you anything other than very surface level. Like, I don't know. It was slow. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like I liked it when it was fast, do more fast. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, but if you were doing a podcast, if you were doing a Twitch stream, if you were doing stuff like that, then I would feel very comfortable of like, okay, this is generally my thoughts. These are things that are actual problems. Figure out a way to do it. And then here are, are solutions that I am offering to very specific issues. Uh, in general, the only thing that you can control is whether or not 
what you've done is on purpose. And this is something that I have found of uh, solace in specifically with this season of world's greatest con, which has reached a larger audience. That show has reached a larger audience than, than most things that I have done. And so you are getting feedback from many different people, some of which have never heard of you or have an adversarial relationship because you're being compared to their favorite shows. And so in a weird way, they are defending their favorite shows. But the only thing that I know is at the end of the day, if they're complaining about a thing I did on purpose, mm. I, I'm fine. Like if they're like, Oh yeah. Brian talks about himself a lot. It's like, <laughs> yes, that's the-, that's the point. That is what we have tried to do to yeah. differentiate ourselves because there's a lot of different history podcasts, but there's only one where Brian talks about himself and he's a fascinating person. I think the stories are really good. If that's the, if that's the knock, then that's fine. You came into an ice cream shop. You expected barbecue. You, you're one star. Yeah. A Baskin Robbins didn't have ribs. We'll see you in the like, summer. <laughs> that's fine. Like, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm totally okay with, 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 with all of that. And I think that's, you know, when, when Andrew says, um, this is, uh, 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 did I do everything I wanted to do? That's what you need to focus on. Yeah. Is, and, and that to me, is really what craft is. When you talk about craft, when you talk about improving, it is knowing when you're going into something, okay, I've done this enough times, I know where things have fallen apart, I now not only know how to avoid those pitfalls, but I'm setting my targets for what I want to do going forward. And that's, look, it, it's the reason why the, the, the books for which I did the most editing for Andrew mm-hmm. are like nowhere near as well read, right? Because he did a lot. He did a lot of stuff where he was learning what his style was. He was learning how to make a coherent narrative. He was learning how to write a compelling villain, how to write a, 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 a protagonist that can go, like he said, four, five, six Books. novels. Yeah. Uh, uh, this was stuff that, he had to get out into the world before he could figure out what to do. And so the, the lesson as always, man, is just make, 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 create release, understand that like all that fear and all that terror that goes into putting something out into the world and wondering what people are going to think about it are literally the treasure map of you building your craft. Like you gotta, you know, if it's, uh, uh, to to worry about putting out something that isn't up to your standards is like worrying about dying in a video game once. It doesn't <laughs> matter. Yeah. It really doesn't. Right. Uh, 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 you and and you have to do it. Like a video game where you beat it on the first thing sucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know this <laughs> yeah, is yeah, yeah. Uh, creativity is Dark Souls. It is it is Elden <laughs> Ring. You are dying constantly. Uh. Uh, already any last thoughts? I think, I think that was very, a good there we go. Oh. Yeah. We did a good conversation. Shout out to Andrew again, oh, Andrew. an amazing, an amazing accomplishment for him, uh, on his now third franchise, you know, starting to, uh, starting to do a, a third active franchise really. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you everybody for listening to the after things podcast for Andrew and Justin. I've been Bryce. It's been after. <laughs> Alrighty, hey, that's the show. Thank you, everybody. We're going to go offline. We'll be back with Cord Killers in a couple of hours, I believe. Uh, we've got one, uh, 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 W. Scotus One, who will be oh, in studio. Oh, Willie. Yeah, Willie's in studio. For Big Cord Willie Killers. style, all in it. That's right. Uh, Alrighty, well. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll be back in another time. Yep. Check out make sure Justin R. Young on Twitch. That's a me. On Twitter, all the good stuff. Bye, everybody. See you.